those of you who have been diligent in um, keeping up with the weekly or daily devotionals, I should say, know that um, a week to 10 days ago, I did a, a daily devotional on Fanny Crosby. And one of the interesting things uh, to me about her is that she was someone who, despite her blindness and some loss in her life, for instance, her, her one and only child died um, as an infant, uh, she, or, or as, as a young child, she looked at those experiences and rather than begrudge them, rather than become bitter about them, she saw them as opportunities to grow. I think maybe it's easy to look at um, the topic of the class tonight and think that, wait a minute, how can you find God in the midst of sickness? Well, I think after we're finished tonight, you may have uh, a better understanding of that. So let's let's turn. We're, we're actually going to start with somebody who didn't have physical sickness or really much problem in life at all. Things seem to be pretty rosy for uh, this person, uh, for the um, man we're going to be reading about. So let's read and then begin to make connection and transition. Uh, if somebody would read Mark chapter 10, verses uh, 17 through 22 for us, the, the rich young ruler uh, and the kingdom of God. Somebody read those verses for us. As, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good teacher? Uh, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not default. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all this I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack. He said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and, and you will have treasures in heavens. Then come follow me. At this time, the man fell, the face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Matthew and, John, and Luke also record uh, this account in their gospel uh, record of Jesus' encounter with this rich young ruler. The reason I chose Mark's account is because Mark includes uh, one little phrase that the others do not, and that is that Jesus loved him. Now, I think that's significant uh, because of what happens afterward. What we're going to see, what, what we know to happen in this story is that the rich young ruler walked away when Jesus told him what it what he needed to do to inherit eternal life, and so his walking away was not because Jesus was mean to him or 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 asked too much of him or offended him in some way. Uh, it was because of a choice that he made. Jesus loved him. And so I want uh, to emphasize that as we talk about the question. And so here's the question. Scripture and experience indicate that it is broken people who seek Jesus. Even people, and this is going to describe many of us, what I'm about to read now. Even people who were raised in families that gathered regularly with the church, made a commitment, and were baptized into Christ during their youth, and have been part of church all their lives must likely experience a brokenness before they can true, uh, fully appreciate the need for God. It was hard for the moral, influential, self-reliant, rich young ruler to see a need for Jesus. Money solved most of his problems. 
and his obedient lifestyle seem to blind him to his sin. Why does it seem like most everyone needs to experience a brokenness before they can fully appreciate their need for God? Dale, what do you think that is? Dale? Yeah, Tim. Brokenness is a term found in the Bible. Now, perhaps we use it as an image for people overwhelmed with trouble. The best found was in Psalms 34, 18, the Lord is near to those brokenhearted, mm -hmm. those crushed in spirit, Psalms 34, 18. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, Psalms 147, 3. But the ones that we're most familiar with is the sacrifices to God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. Psalms 51, 19. Words of David. In my study, I've not found it. And with all my escalating problems, I found it so hard to have a contrite spirit when I pray daily for healing to say, Lord, not my new will, but thine be done. So, so what you're saying, Tim, is that um, dealing with health issues has become a greater challenge for you. Yeah. Others, why does it seem, and it's not always in the form of, of, of um, sickness, why does it seem like um, it's in the midst of some kind of brokenness, some kind of really listen. failure that people begin to appreciate um, and seek after God in their lives. Well, Dad, I, I feel like the, my a quality of life, you know, you know, I, I may be going through some suffering or hardship, and that kind of, kind of pushes me, you know, uh, to know that uh, God's there for me. You know, I mean, uh, just you know, sometimes don't have a, the greatest relationship with God, and and God is, has to be first. You know, I mean, I, you know, I do suffer and I have hardship, but I put God first, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll get me through all this, you know, just believing in him. Well, let's, let's break down the rich young ruler for a minute. I, I think this may help us um, get at least where I'm wanting us to go. Um, he walked away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he came to Jesus asking a great question. He said, I, I want eternal life. What do I need to do? Jesus answered his question, but he walked away. Why did he walk away? His richness was his God. All right. The Bible says clearly that he, he loved money and he was wealthy and he didn't want to give that up. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. Think about that for a minute. What's the trade that he's making here? His soul. All right. He's giving his soul, his relationship with God for money. Yes, sir. That doesn't sound like somebody who has arrived at a proper understanding of what is truly important in life. That does it to you all. I mean, maybe I'm the only one who has that understanding. <laughs> No, I mean the 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 man was rich. He was young. He good looking. I mean, I and <clears throat> he had everything in his eyes, you know. But he seen Jesus. I mean, he seen the miracles that he, he was doing, or or how kids were flocking up to him, or you know, just just his presence. And I think he wanted that kind of presence because he had the money, but he didn't have people feeling like that about him, like he was feeling about. Jesus, my opinion. He, so, so gave what, up his, he thought he was, uh, to him, it was giving up security. That's, that's all he had known. And I don't think he really understood uh, what Christ was saying. I, I don't think he understood the magnitude of what Christ 
was asking him to do. He initially, wow, I have all the security and I have to give it up. I mean, that, that would be hard for us to give up. Sure it would be. So uh -huh. what, what would it have taken yeah. for him to, to, to get to the point where he said, you know, what Jesus is offering is so valuable, I'm willing to give up anything. What would have got him to that point? Tim, go ahead. He's done all the steps. Did he come to Jesus for Jesus' sake? You're there, fella. I'll pat you on the back. You're doing it. And he took Jesus right around and went backwards. No wonder the young man left disappointed. That's right. I, I, I agree with you completely that that's what he expected from Jesus. Pat on the back. You're right on, you're right on target, young man. You know, you don't, there's nothing you really need to do. Just, uh, just keep, um, keep doing what you're doing. And so when Jesus said what he did, he wasn't ready for that. So what would brought, have brought him, what would bring him, what's brought many a rich young ruler to Broken. the senses? <laughs> Broken. Brokenness. Brokenness. See, here's what brokenness does. Brokenness usually happens when we experience something that we cannot at least easily fix. Something beyond our control. Something that shows our vulnerability, our weakness in some way. Uh, here's it, here it is. Shows our need. You see, the Bible, when talking about God, uses language like this hunger, thirst, seek, pursue, long for, when talking about finding God. Well, if you're the rich young ruler and you don't have anything in your life that you need, if you don't have anything in your life that you, you hunger for or thirst for, um, God you know, he'd be a nice add-on, but there's not, there's not that longing there. And so here's the bottom line. Most people won't do that. They won't long for God. They won't hunger for God. They won't thirst for God until they have a true felt need. Yep. That's why brokenness is often so important in a person's true transition in life, even for those of us who have been involved with church our whole lives. It's an experience that happens in our life that breaks down our self-reliance, that breaks down our, um, our, our lack of need and, and points out our vulnerabilities and our need that oftentimes leads us to seek after God in a more uh, deeper and uh, significant way. What are the thoughts about that? Well, Jesus, Jesus didn't ask everybody to drop everything, sell everything and follow me. Right. If this was a special, special young man and God, you know, Jesus thought, of course, this is a whole problem of, you know, Jesus foreknows everything, but the point is, in other words, Jesus knew this guy had the potential. In other words, he could be one of the one of the all stars in this forming all this and doing all this great work. And uh, you know, this guy obviously loved God. He loved the Word of God. He loved good things. And uh, you know, Jesus challenged him. And the reason he was hurt was he couldn't pull the trigger on it himself. Now we have no idea, you know, what happened to his life afterwards. And I choose to believe that just like Peter made a big mistake and got another chance and lots of people did, you know, I think he, you know, at that point, he just couldn't pull the trigger on that kind of commitment. Doesn't mean he never did, but we've all struggled with those, those times or lapses in our lives of trusting. Yeah. And I think you're exactly right. We don't know what happened. And I'd love to hope that he, he did make that uh, commitment later on, but my, mm -hmm is if he did, there's something in his life that he ran up against that pointed out his need in a way that he had never experienced before. I'm going to guess that that was what was involved. 
And because like, look what the apostles say. The apostles say, "Well, who can go to heaven? This is impossible." You know, that was their reaction. Yeah. Poor guy. What else you want to want out of him? He's a great guy. Yeah, he's the, he's the, he's exactly what we've been looking for. Yeah. Um, the the significance of of brokenness is yeah. is I think um, it, it can't be um, overstated because it when we recognize our need is when we're apt to start turning our lives more fully to God. And so let's continue that line of thought in question number two. No one wants to get sick. Our world has been turned upside down by an invisible virus that has sickened some and killed others. How has sickness, and we're talking about sickness in general, flu, recovery from surgery, battling cancer, whatever it may be for you, how has sickness affected your life? This is just a little personal testimonial time. How sickness affected your life? I shared this with a coworker about three or four weeks ago. I grew up going to church, but when I was 17, 18, I started trying to do my own thing and, I, and it was easy for me to skip because with my parents going to deaf church and I had a hearing church, I could, I could show up at one and they not know that I wasn't, you know, I could miss easily and they'd just think I was at the other one. And when I was 18, I got chicken pox, which led to HS purpura, which is the precursor to the kidney disease I have. So long story short, I was in the hospital for two, two weeks in a hospital bed where I couldn't sleep. And so my brother brought me a tape recorder and sermon tape from a workshop that I chose to skip that normally I would have went to. And I listened to these sermons over and over again. And that's when I decided that I was gonna to go to the AIM program and get involved in ministry. And so then what I told this coworker of mine was, I'm the Christian I am today because I got sick. Hmm. If I hadn't, gotten sick and put in the hospital, I don't know who I would be today. Do you have a testimonial to give uh, evidence to what we're talking about tonight? Okay. Yeah. What else? How has uh, sickness affected your life? How many of you are pitiful uh, patients when you're sick? I, <laughs> you, you can raise your hand for your husband if you wish to. Um, that's what, what it takes. Um, <laughs> most of us guys are pretty pitiful patients. Uh, at least I am. And the thing about, about that is when I'm, I'm sick in bed, I, I'm humbled because I have to have somebody else take care of me. I mean, in the sickness like flu and when you can just barely get to the bathroom and that's about as um, big a deal as you can accomplish for the day, uh, it's, it, depending on others is, is, part of the, is part of the package there. What I've also found in the midst of sickness is that the world actually can operate without me <laughs> up and around, which is terribly, a terrible blow one's pride and um, appreciate my health a great deal more. So sickness for me is a humbling experience that causes me to have greater gratitude. Mike has given uh, a testimony to how it has caused him to examine his life and to truly seek after God. Someone else. You know, when I was, uh, in 2015, I was diagnosed with a congestive heart failure and I was in the uh, hospital for about a week. I thought I had bronchitis and being stubborn as I am, I didn't want to go to the doctor until Tracy made me. Well, when they came in and did all heart tests, they told me my heart was functioning at 10 percent and I decided then that God's in control of my life and I'm gonna let him take control of it if he wants to take me home he can take me home 
But the whole time I was in the hospital, I heard all the people in the rooms around me being ugly to the nurses and, and, you know, moaning and crying and hollering out. And I think it's because they didn't know the God that I know. And so in the midst of your sickness, it, it highlighted um, why you depend on God and the, the comfort that comes from depending on God as you looked around and saw other people who didn't have that. Exactly. Dale. I hear a voice, but I can't tell where it's coming from. It's me, Brenda. Hey, Brenda, go ahead. So um, sickness has been plagued um, Dave and Maya and our kids' lives for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been at death's door, Stephen's been at death's door, and each and every time that I would get a new medical diagnosis on the kids or on David, I would like run to ladies Bible class and ask for prayers. And I knew that I had that support organization with the church um, that they, they had my back. And when people would say like, how are you dealing with all these things? and not falling apart, it was like, because I've got God and I've got these women who are my prayer warriors who just, I know they're there for me any time of the day or night. On the opposite side of that, um, there was a point where it was like, God, if, if anything gets worse, it, it's going to kill one of my children. I mean, that's the only thing that can happen next that's going to get to me because everything else has happened. So what is it going to be? Are you going to take one of my children from me or not? You know, and, and I let, I let Satan seep in in those moments, but I did notice one of the things I've noticed from my own personal illnesses is being able to be still and know God. And, and I had to, I was forced into doing that when I got mono, that I had to be still. And that was a hard lesson. So there are lessons, there, there, is, there can be a blessing to, to sickness. Uh, you use the word or phrase, um, what's, what else is there or what's next, God? Uh, which is a great lead in to um, talking about Job. And so let's, let's move to question number three. Health is such a priceless gift and it can be taken away so swiftly and unexpectedly. This can bring brokenness into our lives. Job knew the feeling. On one day, almost everything dear to him was taken away. When that crushed him, Satan plotted to take away Job's health too. This led to Job's miserable, agonizing complaints against God. How did Job's sickness ultimately lead him into a deeper relationship with God? Can I say something this windy? We would have never guessed who that was. I know, I know. Identifying yourself. <laughs> I've, I've had a few things I've dealt with in my little life. You have? But the, the, I don't know, the things that I go through sickness-wise or mentally or whatever, I get, I, I mean, it doesn't bother me when I, people are like, you're in the hospital again, da, da, da. I know, but it's like, it doesn't bother me because God is not going to give me something I can't handle. So I, I just figure it's the next step in my life to make me stronger. And that's really how I feel. And I'm not saying there's not times I haven't got down. I mean, you, goodness, I have. <laughs> but the next day comes and the next week and the next year, and I'm still going. And so I figure whatever God does, even if it's death, it's going to be used to his glory. You have learned to be content in whatever circumstance you're in. Well, I feel like I am. I don't, yeah. I just don't stress much. So, yeah. Well, talk, talk, go ahead, Tim, about talking about Job. Yes, I can tell you, whoever takes care of you, you get a lot more done when you're nice to them than yelling at them. 
He was talking about nurses. I'll tell you this, if you're nice to them, they won't stop being nice to you. And <laughs> nice to his friends till they got to Paris. But he wasn't nice to God. He wanted answers. He wanted answers now. And you saw how that was handled. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that some more. Here's, here's some things I want you to notice. If you read some of Job's, Job's protests, you'll notice that Job considered himself a pretty uh, righteous man, and God would be in agreement. God called him blameless, the most righteous man around. But here's the deal. If you go back and you look, in, especially in chapter one, where Job uh, makes sacrifices for his children, just in case they've sinned against him in some way, you almost get the sense that through um, Job's sickness, he learned that everything was a gift from God, not an exchange with God. that there was a need he could not make a trade for, that there would have to be an appreciation of the gift that God was giving to him. The conversations with his friends clarified some of his beliefs about God as well. And then as uh, Tim pointed out, when God confronted him, he saw the greatness of God and kept his mouth shut. It was humbling for Job. Now, one of the things that's happening in our world right now is uh, hopefully we're being humbled, but, but I don't see a lot of it. What I see is human efforts to react out of pride and look at what we can do to resolve and fix this circumstance. Um, turning to God. But that's what was, uh, but that's what I would hope would happen. So, what do you see in Job that, through Job's sickness, that led him into a deeper relationship with God? Bill, what would you do if your wife said, "Curse God and die"? Now, talk about health that's bad and that probably made him draw closer to god her bringing that up yeah his wife uh his friends uh people who in the past had utter respect for him treated him like he was insignificant and unimportant so job had really nowhere else to turn for support which would have uh, ideally deepened his relationship with God. What else do you see that may have brought Job closer to God? Well, it's Peter. If you go back to, to the rich young ruler deal, oh, there's, a, there's an important play on words there about goodness. You know, when he says, good teacher, and Jesus declines at that time, but but the, that's because there's two Greek words. One of them is comparative, uh, is comparative goodness. Well, okay, in our group right here tonight, some of us are gooder than others. We are. Some of us are farther down our Christian walk, and we don't do as many stupid things, and we, we're better than we used to be. So we're, some of us are, are so high up that we figure we you know, haven't got a, a prayer. Jesus turned it down, okay, because there's only ultimate goodness in Jesus and God, and that's an entirely different word. And so uh, one of the things I think that Job had to deal with is, okay, when you are a comparatively good person and you are gooder than most other people, okay, it's easy for you to think, I don't deserve to have sickness. I don't deserve to have things right because I am a good person. Well, Jesus would say, you're comparatively good over some people, but anything that happens to you is really fair because you're not an ultimately good person. You're a fallible person. And, and so, you know, that's a battle okay, for those of us that have been blessed 
with very little health problems like me. I'm 77 and I've never had a, you know, anything to me. Okay, I'm 70 and uh, <laughs> just like I'm 70, never had a surgery, never had a prescription, you know, none of those things, but my time is coming, okay? And when I get it, okay, all right, I deserve it because I'm only comparatively good some of the times. I am needful of God and sickness is, is fair for me to get just along with everybody else. And that's what I want to impress upon us tonight is that it's only in the need that many times people have the hunger for God. It's only when I feel the need. We always have the need, but sometimes we don't feel it until something happens in our life to bring it to our attention. All right, it took that for Job. Uh, the rich young ruler, we hope it happened for him. And then there's a guy by the name of Naaman. So let's turn over to First Kings chapter. Here's where Henry helped me today. He, he was reading ahead, being a great student. And he noticed that it's not First Kings, it's Second Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. So I apologize uh, if you have... Uh, prepared for class, and you were wondering what, where is, where is he talking about? This is Second Kings chapter five, one through sixteen. So, if somebody would read that for us, please. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master, and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me? to be cured of his leprosy. See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him to say, Go. Wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. And not Abana, or are not Abana and Par Parpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you to wash and be cleansed? And so he went down and dipped himself into the, in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept the thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Okay. I think many of us who have um, in our 
lives that we love who are not in relationship with God. We have, um, we've either prayed or wanted to pray that those, that, that God would do something in their lives, that he would do whatever it takes. Maybe some of you have prayed this, that God would do whatever it takes to bring this person to his or her senses and they that this person would follow the would would come into relationship with god but we're hesitant to pray that prayer honestly aren't we we're hesitant to pray that prayer because we know that bringing a person to the point of need may entail something pretty severe a sickness an accident a broken relationship something that humbles them to the point where they recognize a need in their lives. And so I know people who have hesitated to pray that prayer, even though in their heart of hearts, they wanted uh, the person they love to have relationship with God. They were hesitant to pray the prayer because they knew that it might entail something severe. All right. That's the backdrop that I want to ask this question. Despite his leprosy, apparently Naaman lived a reasonably normal life and would be considered sec uh, successful. Under Jewish law, lepers were treated as outcasts. Because of the presumed contagion of leprosy, lepers were required to call out unclean when people came around. So what are some of the ways that leprosy might have affected Naaman's life? What are some of the ways he might have been affected? No close relationship. All right, no close relationships. Um, we can uh, we can relate to this in our time. Uh, he probably had to practice some level of social distancing. <laughs> Total. Yeah. yeah. If if under Jewish law, he would have certainly had to do that. What else may it, how that might that have affected his life? <laughs> It says eventually, he had a, you die from leprosy eventually. All right. He, he could have had that hanging over his head and as kind of a, a point of anxiety, uh, knowing that it could take his life. It, it might have made him the soldier that he was, as good as he was, because he felt like he had nothing else to live for. So he put his all into the army. Could have been more courageous. In fact, what I, I wrote down, Mike, is that you see that Naaman had a little edge to him. You know, the, um, the servant girl obviously had an affection for him, but the way he reacted to, in, to all of this was kind of a pridefulness that reveals there was, there was an edge to Naaman, okay? And that may have been because there was some bitterness about his sickness. Well, Dale, all he had to look forward to is one of the two kinds of lepers, either the lean arm, which you may, you grotesque, or you lose your senses. Mm -hmm. feelings, and the mice would chew them all. So he had nothing to look forward to. P pretty dismal future. Yeah, yeah. So here's the, here's the question again that's the theme of the class tonight. How did leprosy lead Naaman to God? It made him humble. All right, number one, it made him humble. What did Naaman ask for? What did he ask for? What was he seeking? Come on, what is he, what's he seeking? Instant cure. He's seeking an instant cure. What did he get? <laughs> Something to do. All right, he got something to do, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about big picture now. What did he get ultimately out of this? Relationship with God. He got relationship with God. He asked for instant healing. He got something. He got that, but he got something much bigger and better than that. But he had to go through this humbling process to get there. 
Keep talking about it. How did leprosy lead Naaman to God? First of all, what was what was his reaction to the instruction? No. First of all, what was his reaction when uh, the prophet didn't show up? Come on, it's in your Bibles. Respond. He was angry. He felt insulted and slighted and just dismissed as a, not being a man of importance. That's exactly right. Wait a minute. I, I'm, a, I'm a high official. There, the prophet should have shown up, uh, looked me in the face, and, and told me what he wanted me to do. Well, when he got the instructions about what he was supposed to do, what was his reaction? Why should I have to do that? What's that? Just why should I do, have to do that? Yeah, I, I don't like it's not the, what I wanted. It's not what I wanted. That's don't not you dare I, put me in dirty water. I want clean best of the best because I am the best. All right. <laughs> what do you see popping out popping out in every direction from Naaman? Pride. 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 See, see, he thought leprosy was what he needed to have cured. What did he really need to have cured? It's pride. Pride Heart. was the greatest sickness that he was dealing with. He a much bigger issue than leprosy was for him. His ego. He was reacting in so many ways like many of us humans react. The cure didn't make sense. The prophet didn't show proper respect. He was try, still trying to do things on his own until someone pointed out his brokenness and asked why he was fighting it. See, that's what pride does. You, you've each probably got somebody in your life, at least one person in your life right now, who you're saying, I don't know what it will take for, for them to get, to get through to them, for them to seek after God. Um, I would venture to say that the biggest thing you're dealing with is pride. Okay. It, that's the thing that's really in the way. And so Naaman had to come to the end of himself. That's why I don't think it's manipulative to approach someone who is in the midst of their brokenness due to a loss, due to a disappointment, due to a, uh, a sickness, I don't think it's inappropriate to use that circumstance to talk about God because pride is what keeps many from God in the first place. And it's in that moment of need, in that moment of humility, that they are most likely to receive the message. Okay. Yeah. Ever go to somebody sick and say, God meant this for good. That's the worst thing you could say to them. You just cry with them. And pray. That's all you can do. But if you, in the course of talking with them, can lead them to a relationship with God in the future, they will be able to look back and say, God meant this for good. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's our, our bedside approach. Reaction to the humbling of Naaman. Dale. Yes, Roger. You speak of the idea of being humbled or being brought to back to God through disease. And I hear that prayer, Summit Greenlawn. Please, God, please bring America back to what she used to, bring her back to you, whatever, whatever the terminology happens to be at the time. And one thing bothers me about that, and that is that God answers our prayer, per, perhaps answers our prayer when he gives us coronavirus. And immediately upon receiving the answer to our prayer, we ask him to please remove the coronavirus. Yeah. But that may be what brings some people back to God. Is something as serious 
as coronavirus. I just want to amen that. Yeah. And I think that's that's what all of us who have a heart for people would, would hope and, and pray that, that that the humbling that's taking that should be taking place will take place and cause not just America but every person on the planet to seek after God in our vulnerability. One quick other point. If one person is brought to Christ due to coronavirus, is it worth it? And you, so before we before we attack and say, oh, this is terrible, and we maybe God's using it, or I know God is using it. I don't think God caused it. I don't think God, I think Satan causes it. Mm -hmm. I think God allowed it to happen because that's what he does with Job. Mm -hmm. God allows Satan to do what Satan does. But at the same time, God has a restraint on Satan as he did with Job and says, I'll let you do this but I won't let you go any further. So I think there's a limit to what Satan is allowed to do. But the point being, my point being, that God uses something like an illness, a pandemic, such as coronavirus, to bring not just America, but the entire world mm -hmm. to an understanding of a higher being known as Jehovah. And our great need for him in our vulnerability. Thank you for pointing that out, Roger. Um, the next question is kind of addressed in, um, in sharing his own personal experience earlier. Let me just say along the lines of what Roger was mentioning, Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh. And it's interesting wording there because he talks about it being a messenger from Satan to buffet or to beat him, to beat him up, essentially. Okay, um, and so that was Satan's purpose in sending uh, the thorn in the flesh. However, it also says it was a uh, a tool of God to keep Paul humble. After he received those um, those those visions, and and so it, Satan intended evil, but God is going to bring about good from it. So I'm going to the last question as we draw close to the close, and I want to hear again from you, similar to last week. How will tonight's lesson bless you, or help you bless others as you minister to them this week? How will tonight's lesson bless you or help you bless others as you minister to them this week? Uh, Dale, it seems to me that uh, pride always seems to get in the way. And uh, <clears throat> in any of our lives, in all of our lives, I think pride in some way interferes or comes between us and God. So I've got to remind myself of that on a continual basis. And uh, thereby allow, allowing me and enabling me to seek God all the time, instead of just when I feel like I need him, when a catastrophe happens. And yes, when bad things happen to some people, it helps remind them that they aren't in complete control. None of us are. But we also need to remember to seek God always. Because he wants a relationship with us, and we don't need to have anything that will stand in the way of that occurring. Very good. Others? How tonight's lesson bless you or help you bless others in the future? Don't become bitter. Stay open to God and the blessings he has given you. All right, that's a great point. Uh, it's easy to in whatever negative circumstance we may experience or what we perceive as a negative circumstance, it's easy to become bitter. And as Peter pointed out earlier, to think, I don't deserve this. Now that was Job's attitude. I don't deserve this. But rather than become bitter, ask God to use it for his glory. Others, how has this lesson blessed you? Thank you. Uh, Dale, I wrote down uh, 
it is, it is time to live for Christ, you know, start praying and put God first. Okay. Priority. Mm -hmm. Others. Dale, I have um, uh, my sister-in-law, Rachel. She has ovarian cancer and um, it's getting to the point where they've, decided to probably go with hospice, in-home hospice. And tonight's lesson has really helped me because I need to minister to the family that, because they've been asking the question, well, why, why Rachel, why her? She's young, she's only 50. And I think tonight's lesson to me speaks to knowing that we have hope even when it hurts. And these are times that we are sweating and that we're not wanting to face. But for me, it's, it's encouraging me because I feel like some of the family is turning to me and asking me if God really loves us, if God really wants us to be near to him, why has he chosen Rachel? Hmm. So I think that's the message that I want to share with them is we still have to have hope even in the midst of our hurt and our pain. Um, just like we've talked about in the Bible tonight with Nahum, you know, he was hurting and I don't think he, he, he realized he was hurting but he wanted a quick fix, an easy fix. Yeah. And so with Rachel, it's not, there may not even be a fix to it. So. So the ultimate message is, is, is in our vulnerability, in our weakness, in our fragileness, draw near to God. Don't, don't blame God. Um, it's, it's natural to ask the why questions, but the answer is found in drawing near to him. It's, it's not found in blaming him or becoming bitter toward him or anyone else. Exactly. We need to remember what pride can do to us. Yes. Yes. Yeah, again, pride is the thing that can keep us apart from God much more than um, any sickness can. And so um, choose humility when you deal with difficulties in life like sickness. All right, it is now 8 o'clock. I appreciate spending uh, Wednesday evening with you tonight, and I wish you God's blessing. Uh, I'd like to say a, a brief prayer uh, together, so let's bow. Dear Father, you are so good and faithful. Yes. I love the passage in Lamentations that talk about your mercies being new every morning. So whatever each person who is gathered in class tonight is dealing with, whether it is a sickness, whether it is a relationship um, struggle, whether it is some kind of, of job issue, whatever is on each person's heart, I pray that it will draw, it will cause them to draw closer to you. They will find you to be a good and faithful Father. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.